It was a romantic weekend, no different than many of the others the couple of three years had spent before. But this one would end in a way that 53-year-old John Asquith would never forget. It had a smell about it, and it just didn't make sense. To get that money, there was only one way. I've never come across anyone as callous and strong. The next thing she can recall is playing there naked. We had no body, no weapon, no definitive crime scene. Today, when you hear the word piracy, you think of unauthorised use of copyrighted material. In this case, detectives were looking for pirates in the bays around Brisbane. It was a curious start to an investigation, and one that would go deeper than the waters in which it began. Around about three o'clock in the morning, the SC rescue boat got called out to an unknown medical emergency on board a boat somewhere in the bay. And it was pitch black. We're just shining spotlights everywhere trying to find this boat that was supposed to be in distress. It took us about half an hour before we actually located it. The boat was in total darkness. There was no navigation lights whatsoever on the boat. Then the lights caught a lady standing on the back of the boat. Hello, are you OK over there? The skipper called out to her and asked if she had a medical emergency on board. She replied, yes. Oh. Hey, sweetie, what's been happening? I jumped over onto the Misty Blue and I asked her what had happened. She said someone must have boarded the boat and I must have been hit very hard and got knocked out from it. What's your name, darling? Um, Trisha Byers. When I went down the steps into the cabin, I saw a man lying on the left-hand side on the bunk. There was quite a bit of blood around. The patient was fully conscious. I asked him what happened, and he said to me that someone had boarded the boat. He heard the female call out, and that's when he got a start, and he jumped up, and that's when he must have hit his head. Yeah, Vic, uh, we've located uh, Misty Blue. We have uh, two injured persons on board, and we're about to take the vessel in tow. We'll be back at our base in approximately 15 minutes. The man and his partner were immediately taken to hospital, where the local police attended. On our arrival, we saw John Asquith and Patricia Byers. John was being treated by medical staff for a head injury. Both of them looked tired, but they were relatively calm in their dealings with us and at a little bit at a loss as to what has actually happened to them. While John was being treated, we tried to ascertain what happened during the evening. Patricia had stated that they'd been travelling out on Morton Bay earlier the previous afternoon when the boat broke down with a fuel filter problem. She decided that they'd anchor up in the channel and stay there the night. Looking good. It is. Almost as good as you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're good. You're good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> They had a romantic evening, they had dinner, they drank two bottles of wine, half a bottle of port. <laughs> they both showered out on the back of the vessel in the nude and went to bed. Pat, wake up. The next thing she can recall is laying there naked, curled across the front of the boat. What's wrong? John with blood over his face, bending over, asking if she was all right. 
They both then retired to the inside of the boat, at which time John has begun an hour, an hour and a half of calling for help over the radio. But it appeared John's wound was not a result of a bump to the head, but something more sinister. The doctor, he told me from his experience of treating injuries, that it appeared to be a bullet wound. And we looked at John and at Patricia Byers, and they all but laughed off the idea as to how ridiculous is that. One would think that if a person was shot in the head that uh, you would know about it. When x-rays were carried out, metal fragments to a depth of seven centimetres were found in John's skull. He had been shot, and detectives were brought in to find out who shot him and why. We then went to the PA hospital to speak with John and also to speak with Patricia in relation to what happened. And we couldn't find Patricia. She wasn't at the hospital. So it was imperative for us at that time to find her. There was two scenarios. People had either got on the boat and assaulted her and shot John, or there had only been the two of them on the boat. Somebody must have had a firearm on that boat. Now, whether it was Patricia or John or other people, that's what we were trying to establish. Police were looking for Patricia Byers, the only witness they had to what may have occurred on the Misty Blue. She wasn't at the hospital where an X-ray had just confirmed her partner had been shot. Nor was she at home. Once we got to the house, there was no one there. And in the meantime, we'd been contacted by the hospital that Patricia had turned up to see John. We spoke with Patricia, asked her what had happened. She told us a story that pirates had come on board and attacked John. She told us that he'd been shot in the head or the pirates had shot him in the head. However, Patricia Byers had never mentioned this when she first spoke to the police. Her lack of such an important detail was an immediate concern. She was asked, was there any firearms on the boat? And she said, no. She was then asked, did, did she have any firearms? And she replied, yes, that she had two firearms at home and there was also one at the uh, business. And we asked her if she'd be prepared to come back to her house, let us search the house for firearms. She took us through the house, basically, and showed us where the air rifle was. She then gave us a 22 rifle which had a scope on it. Okay. She was quite helpful and didn't appear to be worried in any way about the consequences of taking her weapons from her. She used to operate a fishing trawler and she used to use the firearms to shoot sharks and also she had some pet parrots on their property and cats used to come and attack the parrots and she used to shoot at cats. She also took them to the business that she and John operated, where another weapon, a 10-gauge shotgun, was confiscated. After collecting the firearms with Patricia, we asked her was she prepared to come back to the police station to be interviewed on audio and video. She said no, but she would talk to us off tape. We asked her was she prepared to undergo a test on her hands. To establish whether she had fired a firearm recently or to eliminate her, this was purely voluntary for her and she was not compelled to undergo that test in any way and she declined to undergo that test. She also said that she just wanted to get back and see John at the hospital. So we then took her back. Meanwhile, the Misty Blue had become a crime scene. We've gone inside the cabin of the boat. The left-hand side, the port side, was where John had been laying. We noticed in the V section between the two bunks, there was a quantity of dried blood in the floor well. And on the right-hand side, the starboard side, there was the blood splash pattern. 
and also splashed up on the cushion. And on an examination of the drive blood, we found small fragments of metal, consistent with that of a splatter from a bullet, as well as on the wall of the bulkhead, which we took possession of for forensic examination. When these fragments, along with those from John's skull, were examined microscopically, they were found to be gilded. Because they had gilding material adhering to them, this would indicate that it's most likely a .22 calibre weapon which has fired this projectile. That firearm was recovered by detectives and brought to police for further examination. However, in this case, the pieces of projectile were damaged to such a great extent that there was no markings on them which could be used to match it back to an individual firearm. So Patricia's 22 calibre rifle with a telescopic lens could not be ruled in or ruled out. And at this stage, neither could her story about pirates. Well, I don't know of any pirates in Morton Bay. It could have been a valid story. We had to confirm or deny her story. There was nothing missing from the boat. Radios were on board, all the fishing gear, barbecue, that was all on board. Even John's wallet was still on board. There was nothing taken whatsoever. And then if you're talking about pirates, they would be going on board to take something. So the only options that could have happened on the boat were that John had tried to shoot himself. Although very unlikely, because where the bullet was in the top of his head, there was no physical way that a person could hold a long rifle back and shoot themselves in the head. Another option that we did have, which was that Patricia was the one that shot him. The only other option is that it could have been a domestic fight on the boat and things had gone bad. And subsequently, John had been shot in the head somehow. Once John was sufficiently recovered to be interviewed, we went to the hospital and spoke to him. We made a decision to tape the weapons up to John to make sure that they were the guns that were in the house. He identified the shotgun and said that that was the one from the shop. He identified the air rifle and said that was the one from home. However, with the 22 rifle, he said he had never seen that before. We asked him why was he so positive he had not seen this 22 calibre rifle before, and he said it was quite simple. The one that they had at home didn't have a telescopic sight. So immediately that raised a suspicion in our mind. We suggested to John that maybe Patricia had shot him. He was totally aghast at that suggestion and said that uh, no way in the world that could never have happened. As far as he was concerned, they had a, uh, a very good relationship and there was no problems whatsoever. He was of the opinion that somebody must have come on the boat and had assaulted both him and Patricia. John Asquith had most probably been shot by a 22 caliber weapon. Police had ruled out pirates and an attempted suicide. Suspicion was now with his partner, Patricia. One of the guns she had presented to police was a 22 calibre rifle. But it wasn't the calibre that had caused the concern, but the fact that John had not recognised the weapon. We did a check of that weapon and found that it had been purchased at a, a gun shop in Beanley. The same day, or that afternoon, when John Asquith had been taken to the PA hospital. I then went down to the Beanley gun shop. He showed us his records, and the documents said that uh, the gun had been purchased by Patricia. She'd paid $100 or something for the weapon. The owner did say that she said she wanted a 22 without a scope. The only one he had at the time was the weapon that we had, which had a scope. He did say to her that the scope could be taken off. And he remembered that she also had to go to an automatic teller to get some money to pay for it. From there, we took out a search warrant to get bank details from Patricia. She'd gone to the ATM, which is straight across the road from the gun shop, got the money out, walked across and purchased the gun. We could definitely say that, yes, she had bought that gun from that shop that afternoon. 
We knew then that's why she wasn't at the hospital to see John, because she was out buying a gun. Because she knew, obviously, that we would do a search on the house and would be asking for the weapons. So we were then looking for the fourth gun, the old 22. The blood-smeared half-cabin runabout was towed to Manly for a thorough police examination. The 53-year-old victim, John Asquith of Yatla, had been shot at point-blank range. A 46-year-old woman had also been on board. It's understood the pair had been drinking for some hours. Uh, the boat was supposedly um, broken down and moored in the channel. Water police are now questioning boaties who were in the area at the time of the shooting. This afternoon, police divers began a search of the area where the boat was moored. It's believed they're looking for a .22 calibre rifle. Our immediate thought was maybe the rifle was discarded over the side of the boat in Moreton Bay. However, with the tide and the currents and the movements of the ocean, nothing was able to be located. If Patricia Byers was responsible for shooting her partner, John, then they needed to find a motive. First stop was their relationship. All family and friends said that they had a good relationship together. They got on well, there wasn't any problems, they were in business together. They seemed like a, a happy couple. Everyone we had spoken to had said that it was a good relationship, there was no fighting, they'd never fought. They were going along the lines that they would probably eventually get married. To me, that had to raise a few doubts as to what had happened. But if you go back to the evidence and the evidence was there, Patricia had some sort of involvement in shooting John. The second stop was John's financial situation and who would benefit if he died. John had said that he had one insurance policy and he said that that time beneficiaries were his children. When we got the details of the insurance policy, the beneficiary had been amended and Patricia was the sole beneficiary of that insurance policy. So we then did a check on a registry of life insurance policies and they came back and said that there was another four insurance policies on John's life. Yes. We then took the whole lot of the documents up to John, showed him each individual document. These two? He pointed out that it wasn't no. his signature on any of those documents. None of them. We asked him, did he have any idea who may have done it? He said no. We asked him, would Patricia have done it? And he stated, no, there's no way in the world she would not have done that. The beneficiary for all five policies totaling the amount of $275,000 was Patricia Byers. It appeared Patricia Byers had stood to gain financially if John had died on the night he was shot. But in order to build a case against her, the detectives would firstly need to prove the documents were indeed forgeries. In most cases, when a person commits the act of forgery, they try to reproduce what we call a pictorial representation of the genuine signature. When we compare the specimen signatures of John Asquith with the disputed insurance applications in his name, the first thing we see is there is some attempt at reproducing the pictorial likeness, those loops and whirls. But what they failed to do is to pay attention to the finite things that make up John Asquith's signature, that is, the fluency, the speed of writing, the complex formation of that particular signature and the pressure of the pen on the paper. All the disputed John Asquith signatures fall down in all those areas. They were not written by John Asquith and I was satisfied that all those simulated forgeries had been written or forged by the one writer. and police believed that person was Patricia Byers. Not only were all the life insurance documents sent to the one mailbox address owned by her, but when detectives looked at the records at a medical centre where a checkup was required for one of the life insurance policies, the evidence kept building. There was no booking at all for John Asquith. The only booking that was in there was for a Joan Asquith. She had a blood test taken and was given a certificate and their carbon copy in their receipt book was also made out to a Joan Asquith. It didn't take an expert to see that the documents sent to the insurance company had been altered. So we compiled a photo board 
with a photo of Patricia, showed this to the receptionist, and the receptionist identified Patricia as the person who went to the surgery on that day. While the detectives mounted a case of attempted murder, John Asquith continued to deny Patricia's involvement. That was about to change. He'd gone to his own doctor, said he was feeling sick. The doctor did a urine test, and they found that he had a large quantity of Valium in his system. The circumstantial evidence against Patricia Byers was mounting, but police still hadn't been able to find the missing 22 caliber rifle they believed she used to shoot her partner. My son Ashley was fishing and he noticed a rifle butt or a stock of a rifle. It was an unusual thing to find by the river, of course. And we heard about the shooting on the boat, we read about it in the paper the next day, and we saw it on the TV, on the news. Putting two and two together, perhaps it might have something to do with it. So we decided then to hand it in to the police. The finding of the butt was significant. It was the sawn down part of a 22 calibre rifle. But it was the fact that those who found it lived right next door to Patricia Byers that made it such an incredible find. Well, I thought if the rifle stock was found there and if she had sawn the gun down that she may have thrown the barrel part in the back of the creek as well. I then made arrangements with our police divers, hopefully to try and find the barrel. I wasn't holding any high hopes. Mike, you want to turn around and turn the shot and move it out there? They were only in the water 40 minutes and one of the divers recovered a barrel of a 22 calibre rifle. I thought, fantastic, that was it. That's what we needed. The only other missing link to that part was the actual gun part itself. The barrel was examined and seemed to have been cut. If that same damage was present, on the piece of barrel retained on the rifle. This may have damaged or broken up the projectile or, or caused it to start to deform as it's left the barrel, or it may break up as it strikes an object such as the skull of Mr Asquith. I really think that that's the only thing that saved his life was the fact that it shattered before it hit him in the head. Realistically, if she had cut the gun down with a hacksaw and done a straight cut, I don't think John would be here today. So I thought maybe she'd cut the thing down at the house. So I then took a search one out. When we got to the residence, there was a uh, large workshed and a vice on the bench in the workshed. The area was quite clean, however, Underneath the vice, there was what appeared to be wood shavings. Those shavings, along with the Winchester rifle butt, were taken to a timber specialist to see if the two were a match. Starting with the rifle butt piece, we made a razor cut on the end grain of the wood piece and determined whether it was a hardwood species or a softwood. And it turned out to be a hardwood. Then we load it into a microtome, which is a, a sliding knife. And the knife allows us to cut very thin sections along the three planes that we need. We uh, stain that with saffronin, and that highlights all the wood structure. And we can place it onto a glass slide to enable us to look at the wood anatomy under the microscope. It's a bit like fingerprinting in a way. All species have a different arrangement of the anatomical features. So we're able to look under the microscope and then key those features into a computer database and that'll give us the possible timber types. In this case, the uh, wood turned out to be Betula species, which is a birch. It's a, a northern hemisphere hardwood. When the wood shavings were then compared, the result was what the police had hoped. We determined conclusively that the shavings were Betula or birch. The same timber type and timber species as the rifle butt. I think she cut the gun down at the home at Yatla and put it on the boat, had it there. She had planned to go out that weekend. It was all going to happen on that weekend. Ah. And the 
only thing that went wrong was that John didn't die. He just stayed alive, and I think that wrecked her whole plan. She was then charged with one attempted murder, grievous bodily harm, grievous bodily harm with intent, unlawful wounding, and 11 counts of forgery and 11 counts of uttering a false document. With all the evidence presented to him, John Asquith still couldn't believe that the woman he loved had tried to kill him. But two months after she had been arrested and was out on bail awaiting her trial, John changed his mind. He felt really sick one day after Patricia had prepared him some lunch. And he said that he felt really drowsy and was bumping into things and couldn't stay awake. He said he'd gone to his own doctor, said he was feeling sick. The doctor did a urine test and they found that he had a large quantity of Valium in his system. He said that he was not on any medication and hadn't taken any medication since he left hospital. So she must have done it. She must have put something in his food. This realisation that John came to was like a bombshell to him. He just completely changed his attitude and he realised that Patricia, the woman he had been living with and, in his opinion, had an absolutely wonderful relationship with, had been trying to kill him. However, as police were about to discover, John was not the only man to have fallen under Patricia Byer's spell. After a two-week trial, a jury found Patricia Byers guilty of attempted murder. She was sentenced to 12 years, but was eligible for parole after three. It was thought she would not re-offend. But for one family who had taken a keen interest in her case, the opposite was more likely to be true. I received a phone call from a woman, a um, bit concerned in relation to her father, who had lived with Patricia Byers for a long period of time. And because of what she'd seen in the media, she then had fears for her father because all the assets, the house, the cars, the boat, were all now in her possession. I don't believe you're doing this to me. Patricia Byers and Carl Gotchens had been a couple for eight years, until, as his daughters learned, he had apparently walked out on Patricia on the 6th of July, 1990. And they told us that when they hadn't heard from their father, they had phoned Patricia, and Patricia had told them that they had split up and that he was going to Thailand to be with his Thai girlfriend. She appeared quite emotional about this, was crying and teary, and appeared to be very upset about the breakup. Everything's been taken care of? Sure. You go and enjoy yourself, eh? Oh, thanks very much. According to his boss, Carl Gotchens was intending to see his Thai girlfriend and then return to work after two months. His boss had last seen him three days before his scheduled flight out of the country. He asked me in if, if I'd like to have a beer and I, I was aware that uh, things were probably a bit uncomfortable on the social scene and I said, no, mate, I, I don't really want to um, walk into any um, domestics. They had sat in the car for a little while because Carl had been overpaid $1,000 in his wages and they came to an arrangement that Carl would pay him back over a period of time or, or deduct it from his next pay. It wasn't a big issue because uh, he was a man of honesty and integrity. I shook his hand, uh, wished him well, and said I'd see him in a couple of months when he, he came back from his leave. He was quite surprised when approximately two weeks later, he received a typewritten letter from Carl. It was a resignation letter uh, stating that he uh, would not be coming back and that he had settled with Trish about his house and in some ways he felt he may have made a bad decision, but he said he didn't believe Trish would be left on the shelf because uh, she was a good-looking girl. Okay, yeah, thanks, 
But there was no mention of the $1,000 Carl owed his employer. So his boss wrote back to him at the address Carl had requested all mail to go. His old place, now owned by Patricia. Three months later, he received a cheque for the amount. At that point, I figured, well, all monies had been paid. Carl had made up his mind. We'd send his gear off, and that was the end of the matter. Our first step in trying to locate Mr Gotchens was to try and confirm whether he had actually flown to Thailand on the date nominated. However, he never caught the plane. I contacted Thai Airways and I was told that the flight had been cancelled by a woman purporting to be Mrs Gotchens. Uh, she cancelled the flight and requested a refund. All our attempts to locate him um, were to no avail. The only hint that Carl was alive and well in Australia was the activity on his bank account and the purchase of a pergola for Patricia's place some four months after he had last been seen. So if he had signed that, he was obviously still in Australia and still had some contact with Patricia. Or alternatively, somebody had access to his American Express card and had forged his signature on the voucher for payment for the pergola. So I sent the letter of resignation from Carl and another letter with the ship logs, which had Carl's handwriting in it, to the document examination expert. The conclusion of the expert was that the signatures and the handwriting was not by Carl Gotchens. I also looked at what happened to Carl's assets, which included the house at Yatla, and found out that the house had been transferred to Patricia approximately three weeks after Carl had last been seen. On the transfer document, the signature of Carl Gotchens and the signature of the witness were Vaudrey's. The only genuine signature was that of Patricia Byers. The American Express docket was also a forgery. I went and interviewed the proprietors of the Pagola Company uh, the salesperson told me that he had attended at the address at Yatla, where he had met a woman that introduced herself as uh, Trisha Gotchens, and signed the American Express voucher in front of him in the name of C.T. Gotchens. Now, from a forensic point of view, this was absolutely brilliant evidence. We could then use the signature that Patty Byers forged on the Amex transaction as a benchmark, and compare that with all the other forged signatures that we had on all these documents and conclude that whoever signed the Amex voucher was the author of all the other forged signatures. Police had circumstantial evidence, but they had no body, no crime scene and no weapon. And their prime suspect was due out of jail in less than 18 months. Patricia Byers was the classic black widow. She had attempted to kill her partner, John Asquith, to obtain wealth. And now it appeared she had already had a practice run with her previous partner, Carl Gotchens. And while a body had still not been found, police and the prosecutor brought into the investigation knew they were looking at murder. Months before, about a year before, she'd secretly obtained a copy of his will. The signature that requested the will to be sent had been proved to be a forgery. And she knew that she had to share that house, those assets, with the daughters. So she wasn't going to get everything. And she knew that Carl had started up a relationship with a new woman in Thailand. She knew that he was going to be leaving her. She knew that she was going to lose the house. She was going to be left with nothing. So the night that Carl walked through that front door, he disappeared off the face of the earth. The next step was to ascertain if there was any forensic evidence at the house. 
by the time I did the search warrant, six years had passed since Carl had last been seen. And I found a diary relating to 1990. And on the 6th of July, there was an entry. Carl left, dropped him in the city. And on that same day, a new bed was delivered. The bed just seemed strange. Patricia had told John Asquith that Carl had left her and taken his bed with him, and it had a smell about it. I mean, if he was going to Bangkok, you wouldn't take your bed with you. If you were going to Darwin to then go off to Asia, it just didn't make sense. I was asked to focus on the main bedroom area, particularly to search for the presence of blood. We found a series of very small droplets on one of the walls. These ranged between a half a millimetre to one millimetre in size, and there was about 21 of these droplets. We performed presumptive screening testing of the stains for the presence of blood, and they all came up positive. We performed the luminol examination on the carpet of the room. This is another presumptive screening test for the presence of blood. The carpet was basically placed on top of the gyp rock. There was no underlay underneath, which made it unusual in the fact that it was there in that sort of state. And what we obtained was a whole area of positive reactions on the timber chipboard floor under the carpet. Once we turned the lights back on and had a look at to see where these fluorescent reactions were occurring, there seemed to be areas of dark staining that married up with where the fluorescence was occurring. A DNA profile was created from the blood stains and compared to the DNA from Carl Gotchen's daughters. While it couldn't be confirmed, the blood in the room was consistent with coming from the father of those daughters. The pattern of the blood spatter was also of great interest. Due to their size, it can infer that they were deposited as a result of a strong force being applied to a source of blood. Um, something such as blunt force trauma, or it could be from a gunshot wound. Gunshot wounds typically cause what's called high velocity blood splash. And that type of staining is very small, almost mist-like blood stains. These were very small, so it certainly couldn't be eliminated. Or it could be something as mundane as a sneezing or coughing with blood in your mouth or nose. The bedroom had all the hallmarks of being the likely place of where Carl Gotchens was actually killed. Couldn't say it was certainty, but it certainly looked like it. Obviously, the case would be significantly strengthened if we could find the body of Carl Gotchens. So how did she get rid of the body? There were, at least to my mind, two options. She buried him nearby to where she killed him, which would mean that she buried his body somewhere in the yard. Or alternatively, she took him out on a boat and dumped his body at sea. When John Asquith commenced his relationship with Patricia, the house at Yatla was still in the process of being finished. So I interviewed him about when different things had happened to try and identify if something had occurred where a body could be concealed around the time that Carl went missing. From everything he told me, a likely place was a garden shed that he thought had been constructed about the time Carl disappeared. The shed was dismantled and the area below was excavated by the backhoe. I had hoped that we would find Carl's remains, but there was nothing found. We had uh, no body, no weapon, no definitive crime scene. But what we did have was substantial evidence that Patricia Byers had gone to great lengths to plan and conceal the death of Carl Gotchens. 
Each individual piece of evidence could not prove her guilt, but when it was put together, I knew you could put a very compelling case of murder to the jury. Patricia Byers has pleaded not guilty to murdering her de facto husband. Carl Gotchens went missing in July 1990. Byers claiming he'd run off to Bangkok to marry his prostitute girlfriend. Prosecutor Paul Rutledge claimed all Mr Gotchen's worldly assets, worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, have disappeared through a series of frauds and forgeries directly linked with Byers. Byers' motive to kill Carl Gotchen's money. She knew that to get that money, those assets, there was only one way, forgery. But for forgery to work, Carl had to die. After a month of hearing the evidence, a jury came back with a guilty verdict. The verdict was welcomed by John Asquith, who fell prey to the Black Widow in 1993. Actually enough, I'm pleased to see justice done. Until now, the jury was unaware that Byers was already serving 12 years in jail for that attempted murder. As a result of this verdict, Byers' future is life in prison. Patricia Byers has the right to apply for parole in 2012. As a result of the two cases and her two convictions, rumours arose about the death of her first husband. Police investigated the car accident in which he died, but found no evidence to support the theory of foul play.